one thing that I can say about people riding riverboats today is it is a total departure of what a daily life is today in America. One of the great things is that it's slow, I think magical, and I happen to think the Ohio River is really one of the more spectacular rivers in, in our country. I have been on the river now, this is my 33rd year. I started as a high school graduate. I went down and uh, asked the, uh, the Delta Queen people if uh, I could get a job on that boat, and they said, if you'd be back here at five o'clock this evening, we're headed to New Orleans. And that, uh, that started my whole real love for the river. The bug bites you pretty quickly. The river has always drawn a certain type of person. That hasn't changed. But what has changed is the river itself. The Ohio River today looks wide and deep, and it is fairly deep. That's because of the dams holding back the pools of water. When it was free running, before the original dams were on the river, the Ohio River would almost completely dry up in places in the summer, and people used to be able to walk across this river. And when that happened, steamboats would sit on the river bottom and wait for it to rain. The dams were built to ensure navigation. In this part of the river, the average depth from dam to dam is 26 feet. But we were in water that was just 14 feet, uh, nine feet back here at the New Richmond city front. So we were real close to the bottom, real close to the bottom. When the big boats started to navigate these shallow waters, it quickly became apparent that a new design was needed. The result was a boat built for the challenges the river offered. This is a totally flat bottom boat. And it's built that way in order to get to shallow waters. River boats were made to get to these river banks. And in order to do that, you had to be shallow draft or you would never reach the land. So uh, that's the whole idea of our stage and shallow draft was to get over to the river bank and get people on and off cargo on and off. In the olden days, it used to be anything. It was livestock, it was cotton, it was uh, barrels of whiskey, and all kinds of things got moved up and down the, uh, the river, and that's exactly how it happened. There are 20 lock and dams on the Ohio River uh, from Pittsburgh to Cairo, Illinois. What a lock does is it allows navigation to get around a dam. So we will go in at this level, this elevation of river. We're gonna go into a chamber and they're gonna close the doors behind us. And then they are going to use gravity and valves to fill up the chamber. On board, the movement is almost imperceptible. This is how it looks 500 times faster than reality. As the chamber gets to the next level, the pressure will equalize and allow the lockmaster to open the upper doors, which will be the next level uh, elevation of river, and then we'll, we'll actually drive out of the chambers. One of the biggest surprises for first-time travelers is the volume of commercial traffic on the Ohio River. Commercial boats go 24-7, 365 days out of the year, and need to in, in, in many cases. If they have to get from Pittsburgh to Evansville, and they need to do that in three days, they would have to go uh, all night long. Coal is by far the number one mover of commodities on the river. There's 1,500 tons of coal in each one of those barges. I believe it takes 220 railroad cars to take that same amount of coal and move it from point A to point B. Today, you have radars, we have sonar, you have a swing meter, you have all these instruments that help you, and yet navigation is probably as hard as it ever has been. There's more traffic. One of the biggest things for us are pleasure boats. People, this is a very nice venue for boats to show off their their skiing ability or their jet ski ability or their boat handling ability and it's a challenge. In the early days of river navigation, 
Steamboat pilots had their own set of challenges. The average life of a steamboat uh, in the mid-1800s was approximately five years. Your boat would usually either hit a stump or a snag and sink or catch on fire from the sparks coming down from the stacks or your boilers would explode. The uh, worst steamboat disaster of all times happened in 1865 and it was a boat that was built on the shores of the Ohio at Fulton, just a mile or two upriver from the Cincinnati waterfront. It was a boat called the Sultana. At the end of the Civil War, the Sultana was sent down the, the Mississippi to bring Union soldiers who were mustering out in the south back up to their homes in the north. The Sultana made it seven miles above Memphis when the boilers exploded, resulting in a loss of over 1,700 lives on the Sultana making it the worst marine accident of our country of all time. More lives were lost on the Sultana than 50 years later on the Titanic. And some folks refer to that as the Titanic of the Mississippi. Despite the dangers, by the end of the Civil War, over one million people and two and a half million tons of cargo were moving on the Ohio River each year. Steamboats transformed Cincinnati into the Queen City. Well, Cincinnati was one of the uh, busiest and most important steamboat ports in the uh, interior of our country. One of our early nicknames of Cincinnati is Porkopolis, back in the uh, uh, mid-1800s, and uh, they, they shipped a tremendous amount of pork products by barrel around all the rest of the country. Today, the river still draws a colorful cast of characters, and each year these characters are on display at the great steamboat race in Louisville, Kentucky. Now there's a few things you need to know about steamboat racing. The first is there are no rules in steamboat racing. Uh, the second thing is steamboat racing is not about how fast your boat goes. It's about how you can lie, steal, and cheat the other guy. Uh, so a couple of years ago, uh, we were in Louisville for the race. The beginning uh, of the race was a little contentious. The Bell of Louisville left early. Uh, left before the, uh, the the cannon went off. So we were yelling and screaming, you, you cheated, you, you're not allowed to do that. And, uh, of course, they responded, they can do whatever they want to do. So, so uh, as, uh, as the race progressed, we, we continued to creep up on the bell of Louisville. And um, at the end, we caught them and won. So we go up to the stage expecting to get our set of antlers, that's the traditional trophy, and the mayor of Louisville steps to the mic and says, The winner of the great steamboat race is the Belle of Louisville. <laughs> so the crew was just incensed. They, they, they were, you know, publicly humiliated. I said, well, what do you want to do? Well, we'll steal the antlers. And when they went in to get the antlers, next to the antlers was the mayor of Louisville's ceramic life-size horse weighed about 800 pounds. So they said, you know what, we're taking the antlers and we're taking the mayor's horse. It's not like we could deny that we had uh, taken this stuff. So um, there was a worn out for my arrest. They asked me to come back and turn myself in. And as I did, the Coast Guard reading this whole thing for about two weeks said, you know what, the Bell of Cincinnati has to be designated an official pirate boat. They bestowed us a document that declares us a pirate boat that requires us to fly this flag to warn all the boats around us that this is a bad boat. Bad boat, bad crew, bad intentions. And uh, that's the story of our Jolly Roger. We are very proud of that flag. And we wouldn't take it down if we were ordered to take it down. watching the river go by. This is a, a great life. I just really grew to love the river. 
see in the nighttime on the river. It's just so clear. It just uh, kind of gets a hold of you.